I have come in part to confirm and affirm you, and in part to spit in your soup. So get ready for the second. Um, I'm Dr Maggie Atkinson. I'm not a doctor of medicine, which does not make me a bad person. I'm a doctor of education. I'm just as much of a doctor. It took me just as long. And for me, that's the central point of what I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Can we get this out of the clinic and into the playground, please? I've sat at the back and watched you go, early intervention, let's medicalise it. Early intervention, let's medicalise it. What we need to do is medicalise this for about three quarters of an hour. Mind dead, if it's got a real, real strength here, it is that the primary school teacher who's got 31 children because the 31st admission was a looked after child and the school couldn't say no, and that looked after child is severely mentally ill and just hanging on because it's a primary school, that teacher is about to deal with a brand new national curriculum and a brand new lot of all sorts of other things and a school budget that is standing still in money terms and falling in real terms. And therefore, her classroom support assistance has been cut by half in the last 12 months as well. What she needs from MindEd is an instant access. Please talk to me in language I understand. You have to understand I didn't do anything about brain development when I trained to teach. She needs that from this system. So does the youth worker who's dealing with the older sibling of the child who's just been admitted into that class classroom. None of those people have got a, a shred of medical qualification, and it's great that MindEd is coming in at their level, as well as providing further information, training, and support for people who are medically qualified. I'm on the Secretary of State's Children and Young People's Health Outcomes Forum, and my mission on that forum has been, since it started, to get people to understand that in my terms, early looks like this. I want to take you back to my classroom as a form teacher of year nine children in a school somewhere in the north of England, where a young woman walked through the door of the classroom in tears, not because she was the, the person who was showing clear signs of real illness, but because her friend was, and she was about to break the bond of friendship and tell me. What her friend was doing was not eating at a serious, serious level that her parents had noticed and her friends had noticed and nobody seemed to be able to do anything about. What she thought I, as head of English and drama, and her form teacher was going to be able to do with that, I really don't know. What I did with it was know who to pick the phone up to, who to refer it to, who to get into the school, who to work with the family, who to work with the young woman concerned. I had no knowledge, but what I did know was that I couldn't carry this on my own. I had to share that information, and it was very seriously important that I did so on the day, including breaking the bonds of confidentiality and friendship and everything else that I had with the young woman who was also ill, who I also happened to teach. I wouldn't have known where on earth to go in today's world, because the very early stages of health service reform and reshaping have created what my practice manager's sister, I'm going to use technical language now, says is absolute bogging chaos. She's in one of those parts of the country where there actually isn't a CAMS service to speak of because local authorities and CCGs have gone, how many kids have we got? Ooh, not many. Oh, well, we'll save that money then. So there, are, there is neither tiers one, two, nor three CAMS services available to her child and adolescent population in her rural part of England because the commissioning bodies in both local government and NHS have said, well, we won't do that anymore because we haven't got enough of them. That's why you get a queue for tier four beds of which there are too few. That's why you end up with youngsters on adult wards because that's the only place you can put them on a clinically risk assessed basis. And that's the, the scandal. Because had I been a secondary school teacher of English and drama now in 2014 in the same part of Northern England where I was, I don't know whether I would have known who to pick the phone up to, who was going to come in and help that young woman, who was going to come in and sort me out because I'd watched her fade away in front of my eyes and not done enough about it until another adolescent had brought the issue to my attention. We are in a moment of real opportunity here. If MindEd makes it into the consciousness of all the partners in a locality because 
the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, the work of the Health and Wellbeing Board, the work of the Director of Children's Services, the work of the Director of Adults and Housing and Environment and everybody else gets behind it, and so does the local association of head teachers, primary, secondary and other, then actually what you've got is the possibility of a community coming together around the child. Because do you know what? It's not about you. None of this, if you're a grown-up, I don't care how clever you are or how many letters you've got after your name, it's not about you. It's about them. So I'm just going to quote from, to, to you from my office's submission to the Health Select Committee's uh, inquiry into child and adolescent mental health services, which has gone late, but it's gone. And I want to do it whilst reflecting that I think Minded has one of those foot-in-the-door, wedge-in-the-door moments of opportunity in its grasp if we can all pick it up and make it work. I travel all over England. I'm based 10 minutes walk away. Tomorrow I'm in Derby. Next week I'm in Bristol. The week after that I'm in Nottingham and so on and so on. It happens all the time. And Dawn is my trusted advisor on these matters and I want to pay tribute to the work that she did in getting this response to the stage where we've been able to submit it. We continue to find clear and concerning evidence of just plain inconsistency in truly integrated commissioning, planning, delivery and evaluation. The collection of local data, even where it's collected, whether and how well it's analysed, and I'm just going to pause here and say whether you share it, I'll just say that again, whether you share it, I'll just say that again, whether you share it, as Dame Fiona Caldicott has reminded you very recently, you have no excuse not to do. If it's about the safety and well-being of a child, you have no excuse for not sharing information with your partners who are as professional as you are, whether they're medics or not. We find inconsistencies in how well it's both collected and analysed, and especially how it's shared. We find inconsistencies in even the plain inclusion of children and young people's emotional health and well-being in joint strategic needs assessments and locality plans for the delivery of a well population. If you've got influence in a locality and it isn't in your JSNA, go forth with your burning torch and set fire to it and get it rewritten. Because it has to be. It has to be. Children can be as mentally ill as adults are. They can be as mentally unstable and ill-supported as you or I might be were we, very sadly, to become mentally ill. And it can start very young indeed. If it isn't in the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, it won't be on the agenda for the Health and Wellbeing Board or Health Scrutiny in your local council or the agenda of the CCGs as they get more and more and more and more squeezed. We've been talking about this since 1995, as my response to the Health Select Committee also says. Remember the HAS report? It's 20 years since that was published next year, and still here we are going, ooh, what do you think we ought to do about child and adolescent mental health? Well, we might actually do what we've promised to do, is the first thing. We have promised our children that we will bring them up in a country which respects their childhood, which does not treat them as miniature adults, which treats them as people with a voice and an opinion and a set of rights under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We have promised our children and young people that we will not, for example, except in absolute extremists, put them in a secure setting for any reason. We still have children and young people who are lifted under Section 136 orders and kept behind the bars of a police custody suite for up to four days. Would, would we accept it for our children, is my big question. Would we accept it for the children who grew up under our roofs, is my big question. And I doubt we would. If Minded can actually get in there and change the mentality of the people who access it, and if we can make it a mandatory element of training for teachers and social workers and youth workers and young offending team workers, we will have made a significant step towards delivering on the promises we've been making our children for a very long time. 
Where are the signs of hope? The move back of public health into local authorities, which is why local authorities were invented in the first place, I would remind you. Clean water, sewage, better roads, the disposal of rubbish. That's why local authorities were invented in 1830, whenever it was. And you have come home. If you are working in public health, you have come home. You need to make the absolute maximum you can make of having access to the housing guy and the environment guy and the transport guy and the DCS and the director of adults and the chief executive and the members, the elected members of your body are absolutely crucial to this. We're delighted that they've come home because that sense that I've been listening to about joined upness and people working across service boundaries and dropping the professional badge at the door and really making it for the locality is hugely enabled by the brilliance of public health specialists who understand population level data and can help you drill down to subpopulation level data and super output area and ward and street and housing estate. They know where the issues are and working with the children's and adult services people and housing and others can help to get through to the workforce that mental health is everybody's business. If you had kids falling off their skateboards and breaking their legs right, left and centre, you'd do something about the state of your roads and your pavements. If you have children and young people, one in ten, some estimates far more than that, in every classroom in the land with a mental and emotional health and wellbeing issue, then you ought to be responding in the same way as mending your pavements and your potholes. It's as serious as that, and it's about shaping the, the population of the future. We know that we've been discussing these things for a very long time, but I'm going to close what I say before I take questions, and if I've ruffled your feathers, I'm terribly sorry. No, I'm not. Um, I have mine ruffled on a daily basis, so you might as well join the club, really. Um, we know that there are issues about commissioning, the level of resources accorded, the fact that people don't join with each other in order to shape the system in the first place. They're still working in their old patterns and their old states. We know that tier three, as we used to call it, CAMS, are dealing with more complex and more difficult cases than was the case before because somehow tiers one and two are either not making it or have disappeared. The local authority where I was a director of children's services has lost approximately 50% of its revenue since 2010. I am left in no doubt that the issues that are being dealt with by health professionals in that borough are at least in part because the earliness of early intervention is being taken out from under people's feet. But where else are the signs of hope? We know more now than we've ever known. The Atlas of Variation, the work of CYI Act, the work of the Forum in Challenging the System, the CMO's report from last year, and isn't it great that this year it will focus on mental health? So come on, let's get round that fire and help her to write a really good one. We know that there are possibilities. The strongest possibility for me is when we actually listen to the children and young people concerned. And I was told as I came in that they'd been the best contributors to your conference, and I'm not surprised. So I will close with the story of one who I fear is about to be let down. This little boy was taken into care at two in one of England's very large counties. There are lots of them, so you don't know where I'm talking about. He remained in care until he was 18 and then left care and, like a lot of care leavers, was kind of allowed not to fall off the cliff, but to kind of slither down it, really, slowly, down the scree. Somehow, the care leaving support that he needed was not available, and he had had contact with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services in that big county during his time in care, so people knew he was fragile. Somehow, the disconnect between what should have been there from his personal advisor, what should have been there from the leaving care service in that county, kind of missed him. You know that Doctor Who thing where he puts the key around his neck and you think you can kind of see him, but you can't really? That was this boy's experience. He knows that he can be difficult and a handful. He's aware of that. He's very self-conscious and very self-aware. He got himself in with the wrong crowd. Could have happened to any of us, did happen to this young man. He got himself in with the wrong crowd to the extent that his life was under threat because he got himself in with the wrong crowd that was violent. And do you know what he did? 
He dared to cross the border and go and live in one of the unitary authorities bordering that big county. This is where I come in. He is now 22. The unitary authority says you haven't got any connection with this area, even though he is part of the St. John's Ambulance Cadets, he is at college in the area, his friends are in the area, where he sofa surfs because he's got nowhere to live, his job centre plus is in the area, his mental health nurse is in the area, but guess what? He was in the care of the county across the road. The county across the road is going, well, he's gone. So you've got two statutory bodies going, meh. I am in no doubt that we are going to have to rescue this young man at some point, some of us, and the rescue is likely to be done by adult mental health services because he is drifting, seriously, seriously drifting. We are already at the stage where he doesn't get up properly, he doesn't go into college, he's in danger of losing his place. The unitary authority is going, you are something like 795th on the list of people who might want a one-bedroom flat, so well, you know, there you go. The county is going, well, he's not ours anymore. They are both on the verge of closing his case. This is a young man with a history of quite serious mental illness. Quite serious interventions have been needed in his life so far. And I feel like the helpless older sister because I can't make them do what they flipping well ought to be doing for him. And if he ends up in either prison or an adult mental health facility, which is far, far more expensive than just letting him have a supported flat somewhere, the system will be to blame. Had the system been educated properly, possibly, possibly, he might not have been mentally ill in the first place, because he would have been picked up at school. It wouldn't have been medicalised, he would have been picked up at school, and he might, might, might have been helped. I do not want somebody to write to me and say, guess what? He's not with us anymore. That's how serious this is. That's how important it is. That's why you are your own best network, because you come from so many places, but you all have children at the heart of your practice. I strongly welcome Minded. I think it's got great potential, but it's not the be-all and end-all. You and everybody who works with you and all the children and young people you work with are the be-all and end-all.